we will begin with our third lecture in this uh, series of six lectures and today we are going to look at a uh, very interesting uh, uh, topic of discovery of ashoka and the story of the indian archaeology and uh, history so uh, if we have read anything about uh, you know the discovery of of ashoka or 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 you know how the indian history began we can say that the uh, material evidences or the written evidences in the form of inscriptions started coming from Ashoka. And that's what makes the discovery of Ashoka a very pivotal movement in the history of, of archaeology, not only archaeology, but in, 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 in the history of India itself. Because before that, or even you know, compared to that, the history of uh, India is, is shrouded into the texts, which we know that the text cannot be, uh, you know, uh, they are not the permanent sort of things and, you know, they undergo a lot of changes. But the archaeological evidences, particularly the monuments and the epigraphy, they are, you know, carved in the stones. So it's very difficult for them to change. And therefore, the one of the most authenticate documents there are or the material there is to know the uh, objective history is the epigraphy. And that's why uh, Ashoka matters. And uh, to begin with the uh, discovery of Ashoka, let me let me uh, present you some of the ideas or thoughts beforehand. You know, you see on, this, on the screen, there is this very beautiful image of Akshini, which dates back to 300 BC. And this 300 BC Akshini is very special because she is very polished, very beautiful. And, you know, the same polished thing that you can see in the Ashokan pillar, which is uh, on the other side of the screen. And in between, there is this perhaps the first monument or the monumental sculpture that is there, which is found in Dauli, which is the place in Odisha and has a connection with Ashoka's Kalinga War. And it was, it, it's, it's, it's on looking what is called the Daya River, the River of Compassion where Ashoka fought the Kalinga war. And we know the story that he repented the killings of so many people. And then to, you know, he, he, he become from Chanda Ashok, he became a Dharma Ashok. And uh, in order to commemorate that, he has his edict inscribed on this, on this, on this, on this elephant. And this elephant, as I told you that it might be the first uh, monument uh, sculpted in perhaps the uh, Indian history. Here, the elephant, uh, some of the art, art historians say that, you know, this uh, elephant symbolizes Ashoka. And some of the art historians are, you know, divided over this. They say that, you know, they, this is Buddha representing the Buddha. And we, we are going to see how the Buddha was represented by the elephant. And uh, we, we know the story that when the Buddha, uh, Buddha was to conceive, his mother, Maam Haya, had a, had a dream of, of, of white elephant. And uh, uh, here also uh, one word is inscribed called Shweta. Shweta means white. So, you know, people now are saying that this elephant represents the Buddha. Uh, remarkably, this is only half, half an elephant and another or the majority portion of the, of the uh, elephant is buried in the rock. You know, it is not it sculpted. So it also symbolizes, you know, something, the form and formless. And uh, it's a very special sort of the monument which has handed over to us by 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 history. So with this uh, a brief preface, I will move on to knowing who is Ashoka. So it's, you know, we, we of course know now Ashoka as we know today with a lot of information, but uh, two centuries back, a lot of information was not available on Ashoka. And therefore, you know, H.G. Wells, a very famous historian who mentioned in his book, Outline of History. In the history of the world, there have been thousands of uh, kings and emperors who called themselves their highnesses, their majesty, and their exalted majesties, and so on. They shone for a brief moment and as quickly disappeared. But Ashoka shines and shines brightly uh, like a bright star even unto this day. Sorry for these typos. And you can see that you know this, this concept of Chakravarti, the uh, wheel turning uh, you know, uh, uh, king or emperor is very specific to Buddhism. And it has this, this wheel has got a very special symbol as we have seen as the wheel of the Dhamma or the wheel of the law. So the emperor governed according to the wheel of law, not according to the Danda, 
or the punishment, which was the hallmark of the competitive ideology of the time, the Brahminism. You know, the Brahminism is based on Danda. And uh, the, the, the second uh, photo that you can see here is the modern statue of Ashoka, Dhamma Raja in Nakunsi Thammarat in, in Thailand. So you see that the uh, name of the Ashoka, as uh, S.G. Wells has said, has spread all over the world. And, you know, it is, it is shining like a bright star even today. And one of the important things, you know, the contested legacy of Ashoka is this, that who is Ashoka? And uh, as we can see from this, this minor, minor or rock edict, which was found in Rupanath, uh, Ashoka is openly claiming that he is a Buddhist. So there is no ambiguity about the, 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 the Dhamma or the background from which Ashoka was, was, was interacting with the, with the, with the masses. He, he openly declared that he's a Buddhist. And this is a small sculpture of Ashoka, which is uh, found in the, in the, in the, in the pillars of, of Sanchi, where Ashoka appeared to be fainting after seeing, witnessing the Bodhi tree. So Ashoka had a very special connection with Mahabodhi temple, Sambodhi, which he called. And, and you know, he, he couldn't hold himself when he first time saw the Sambodhi or the Bodhi tree. Ashoka was very special in the sense that he not only built the stupas over the historic Buddha Shakyamuni, but Ashoka also built stupa over the previous Buddhas. So in Nepal, Nigali Saga, there is, uh, there was a statue of, of, of uh, there was a stupa dedicated to Kanakamuni Buddha, also known as Konakagama. And this is where I'm sitting near the pillar, which was dedicated to the uh, to the Akanakmuni Buddha, and you know there, there is an inscription here, Ashokan inscription, where for the first time perhaps the word stupa or thupa is mentioned. So I highlighted it, you know, in the in the red block. So you can see that, you know, it was a, it was the first sort of a reference to thupa or stupa in the history, and uh, also uh, Ashoka erected one stoop in Gotihawa, just nearby that place. Uh, dedicated to the uh, previous Buddha, Krakuchanda. And we, we know for now that he also built a stupa and, and erected a, a Ashokan pillar there in, 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 in Lumbini. But remarkably, when he did all these things, Ashoka is, is conspicuous as the Buddha is of his absence. And we don't have any uh, sculpture, you know, card by, of Ashoka in the Buddhist iconography. So you see, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, also, as Wells mentions that Ashoka's name yeah, was spread from Ulga to Ganga. And according to him, he was, he might be the only one emperor in the world who's, who's, who, who governed so many people in the history of the world. You know, his, his empire was very large. And, uh, you know, uh, many, many people heard his name because he was like, you know, the king who looked after his people. So, you know, the Mauryan Empire, you know, when we talk about Mauryan uh, Ashoka, we cannot but talk about the Mauryan Empire. And, and this is the sculpture of Chandragupta Maurya, the founder of the Mauryan Empire in the Indian parliament, where it is said that the shepherd boy, Chandragupta Maurya, you know, is dreaming of the India he was to create. And uh, this is the, the, the bottom most uh, photograph is, is uh, where he, 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 he attained to his, uh, he met his, uh, you know, he breathed last. And this is the uh, sculpture of Ashoka, which is in Ashoka Hotel in, in, in New Delhi, which is built by one sculpture of Mukherjee in 1960s. So I just wanted to put these slides across to bring out the very much importance, the tremendous importance that Ashoka has got. And, and that's the sign of, uh, that's the uh, coin where where you know alexander is shown and 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 the bottom photograph is the earlier depiction of the city life in india so you see that the mauryan empire was very special not only in 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 terms of the indian subcontinent but in the history of the world and 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 its history really changed the history of the world as we are going to look at so you see that at the time of the buddha there were 16 mahajanapadas and those 16 mahajanapadas were consolidated into into the rise of, of you know, the great state and the rise of Magadha. So the, 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 the first photograph shows the 16 Janapada and in the Buddhist scriptures, the 16 Janapadas are, are mentioned and two of the big uh, 
empires of the time were the Magadha and the Kosal army. And we know that all of them were brought together and forged into a big empire, which was known as, as the Mauryan Empire. So you know we can see that there was a rise of, 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 of what is called the Magadha Empire. Why this backstory is important? Because you know it has to do with, 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 a, with, with present day realities of a country. As to that's how the concept of you know the big uh, empire Jambudvip was developed. So as Al Vasham says, a definite policy aimed at the control of as much of the course of Ganga as possible to conceive the possibility of a far flung empire. So you see, the Ganga became the kind of a central line, central river to build the empire, and 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 we know the history that you know the Gangetic Plain became the bedrock for the big empire to rise. But very interestingly, when we look at the Vedic text, they refer scornfully to the barbaric language of the area and inhabitants' construction of round funeral mounds that were not known to the Aryans. So the Aryans who came to India, you know, they were unknown to the mounds, you know, which we know that later on they, 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 they came to become the stupas. And, 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 and they referred to this area of Magadha scornfully. And we, we have seen in the previous uh, talks that the Buddhists continued this tradition of mounds as the stupas as a representative of the, uh, you know, representation of the enlightenment of the Nibbana itself. And uh, the areas, uh, you know, the people of this area were called the Vraktyas and Asuras. And according to Bronkert, who is a famous uh, writer and historian, the Magadha culture was responsible for the second urbanization in India. So what was the first urbanization in India? So we are going to look into what was the first wave of urbanization in India. But as this famous historian Rai Chaudhary says that India, we don't have the genuine, genuine history of ancient India, no Thucydides or Tacitus has left for posterity any record. Similar uh, view was echoed by a very famous uh, archaeologist and historian, Rajendra Lala Mitra, who has you know, researched into both Gaya, Sarnath and Puri to bring out the importance of the Buddhist history and also the conflict between the Buddhism and Brahmanism. He also said similar things that, you know, there is no, you know, record genuine history of ancient India. And we have, we have seen in the second lecture as to how Baba Sambedkar, it was the same thing that the history has been mythologized. So Mauryan Empire was the end result of a long evolution of city and state formation going back to the Indus Valley civilization. Today, archaeologists are identif identifying the elements of continuity between the two urban-based polities. So, you know, Indus Valley civilization, when we are talking about the Mauryan Empire, we, 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 we have, when we look at the expanse of the Mauryan Empire, it goes all the way up to Gandhara and beyond, you know, all the way up to Kapisa and, you know, Afghanistan. So far, the uh, Indus Valley uh, civilization archaeologists have discovered 1,500 villages and five large urban cent centers of which we know a few like Mohindajaro and Harappa. And the most known is Har Mohindajaro, which had 40,000 inhabitants. So just for the sake of clarity, I have, I have put up a photo here that how the archaeological excavation is done layer by layer. And as the more we go down, the more we, we, we start to dig out into the history. And this, this photograph I took in Vadnagar where the excavation is going on and at the top level, of the strata is the uh, you know the period of Sayaji Rao Maharaj and below that you know different periods and when we go deeper down we find Buddhist remains. So this is how the you know the archaeological uh, ex uh, you know excavation is done uh, you know layer wise and you can see that here. So you know I'm 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 going to do, uh, bring out something very important here is that. The, whenever we talk about the Ashok, uh, you know, the uh, Indus Valley civilization, it's about, you know, the religion is about meditation, people tree, Sosti. And according to Asko Parpola, who is now one of the leading authorities on the Indus, Indus Valley civilization, he says, it is reasonable to expect that the historical South Asia has preserved Harappan tradition. So Harappan tradition didn't die, you know, the culture didn't die, it continued. Though the material civilization was gone, the people survived. And, you know, as he says, late Harappan people outnumbered Indo-Aryan speaking immigrants, fusion of these principal population groups continued for many centuries with mixed marriages and growing bilingualism. So you see, this is a very important point that uh, Asko Parpola, he's a leading uh, authority on the Ashok, uh, you know, Indus Valley civilization has brought this forth. 
and one of the evidences that uh, you know that 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 brings out the continuity between the ivc and the maurya empire is the culinary habits the same kinds of pot the same kinds of grain and the same kinds of eating habits were found in ivc and the maurya empire and another is the city planning matches both indus valley civilization and the maurya empire i think this is a very remarkable point and 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 i don't know i i, I know i have shown this photo to you before but it's very important you know stupa standing on the mohenjo-daro you know if you look at the stratified uh, history which is you know uh, timeline in the different strata of the earth we can see the stupa is is sitting at the top of the mohenjo-daro and this photograph is a, a sculpture found in the ivc and john marshall has mentioned that you know uh, two nagas you know are kneeling before the uh, yogic the man in the yogi position so we 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 are not able to you know still able to figure out because you know the 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 indus valley civilization is silent but you know uh, there is a lot of contestation as to what is what was really there in indus valley civilization i just wanted to you know make some points to show that you know this second wave of urbanization didn't arise in india you know in the vacuum and we we all know the conflict between the shraman and brahmin the shramana rejected the vedic rituals and the authority of the brahmins jain buddhist ajivikas a very special sect which was very dear to uh even ashoka you know were classed as shramana and brahmin disliked the city and civilization this is a very interesting point apastamba uh, sutra of the of the of the brahmanical tradition you know according to that you know the brahmins dislike the cities and the civilization and now that that point is now well made by various researchers so nobody living in the city with his body covered with the dust of the city and his eyes and mouth filled with it can attain salvation even if he leads an austere life and if you look at the buddha or where he stayed for a long long time he traveled everywhere you know all different villages all different pale places even forests but we see that all the important centers of buddhism were were located near the big cities like rajagraha koshambi and uh, shramanas and nastikas are the same classes you know whenever we 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 hear the word shramana we cannot but think of nastikas so these are very important point that is that are important to 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 bear in our minds as we go on exploring how the discovery of ashoka so ashoka was of course the dhamma raja of jambudvip and ashoka was the first in the history of the indian subcontinent continent to use the word dhamma as the universal ethical system of governance with the welfare of humans and animals at the center of his governance so you see there are a lot of now uh, uh, debates over the use of the word dhamma or dharma but in a, in a, in a, in a sense of the universal paradigm ashoka was the first to use the dhamma in that sense and uh, you know the the, dhamma, the word dhamma has multiple sort of variant meanings but you know ashoka if you look at his inscription we can find that you know he used it in terms of universal ethical system of governance and and whenever even you know the greek uh, epithets uh, were were drafted the word dhamma was translated at pat or you know when it was it was drafted uh, you know so crafted in 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 aramaic language the word dhamma became the truth isn't it so we can we can understand the multi variant uh, use of the word dhamma and uh, as we we know that ashoka has 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 ruled the great expanse as we can see from here uh charles allen you know uh, described ashoka as the founder of india because he was the first to give it a kind of the political identity in terms of the creation of jambudvi and as the history goes ashoka dhamma impressed the generations of the rulers and ashoka announced himself as the king of magadha so this this term king of magadha is very important because magadha was the buddhist hotspot and 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 in the history after ashoka in 600 ad uh it was harshavarna's vardana vardana stern to announce himself as the king of magadha because it was very specific it has got such a geopolitical importance to become the king of magadha that we are going to see in the in the in the forthcoming lectures but suffice here to note that you know ashoka announced himself as the king of magadha so i just wanted to bring out some of the points that i have been all uh, you know already articulating one of the important uh, inscriptions about ashoka that was found was ama upasaka ashoka sanchiya mana agra ek stupa a lay worshiper ashoka with religious longing is associated in construction of a prominent stupa so mahastupa all the mahastupas of the time 
you know, they were built by Ashoka. And it was, we will see that how the stupa was also, you know, politically, you know, inspired in terms of when the Ashokan Empire spread and, and how the new stupas were built to commemorate the Dhamma Rajya with, with the Ashoka's empire. So if you look at the Ashoka's, Ashokan India, you know, the, uh, he was, if you look at the, 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 the Magadha of that time or the Jambudipo of, time, of that time, it was a very open and inclusive society. The Buddhism from its inception was, 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 was marked with the inclusion, you know, bringing all different groups of the communities together. And Ashoka was no exception to that. And Ashoka, in fact, played a very important role in bringing into the uh, go, uh, you know, political system, the, the tribes, the forest dwellers, the people living on the hills, and even, you know, uh, encouraging the, follow, you know, the, the foreigners to, to work together. And, you know, this is very interesting point that Ashoka, uh, you know, uh, founded what can be called today the open and inclusive society. And that's why his empire spread like a, like a, you know, wildfire. Now to just give you an example of how, how, how you know, uh, important the Ashokan, uh, Ashokan state was, you know, Indian cities were very large, very, very large in the world, the largest in the world. Like as you can look at this from these numbers, Kaushambi, one of the biggest cities of the time had 1,80,000 inhabitants, while Athens has only 1 lakh inhabitants. And Patliputra was more than 11 times larger than Kaushambi. So you can imagine the population of, of, of Patliputra of the time and three times greater in area than Alexandria and twice the size of Imperial Rome. And it's all, you know, a very, very deeper research is now being done. And, you know, these facts are brought by, 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 by the historians, you know, who have gone into studies of the cities and, you know, the states of the, of the ancient times. German archaeologist E.F. Trich says that founding of Greek cities were inspired by the Indian cities. And according to J.N. Samadhar, the three-fourth of India's early history is the history of Magadha. You see, so Magadha was like the center of the world at the time. So what, by, 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 by which sources we come to know about Ashoka? There are archaeological sources, there are epigraphical sources, and there are Buddhist sources. So, you know, according to French historian Robert Lingert, there are two Ashokas, like one Ashoka, which we see through, see from, or, uh, you know, know from the historical, or from his inscriptions. And there is an Ashoka, which we, 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 we find in the Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, Sihalese, and Tibetan Buddhist text, like Dhammalipi, the Ashokan scriptures, and the inscriptions are one of the sources, and the Buddhist sources, particularly the Ashoka Vadan, which is called the Northern sort of a scripture, which was written in second century common era, Dipavansa, which is the collection of many chronicles, which was compiled in the fourth century common era, Dipavansa and Mahavansa. They became the important sources to know Ashoka. And there is a third source that is of the textual tradition, traditions like, you know, writing of Puranas, where we find a lot of information about Ashoka and, and Buddhism, but mostly in the negative way. And, 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 and though there is a civic silence in Ramayana and Mahabharata and all these Brahminical scriptures, the Ashoka can be discerned in those, those texts as the scholars have now brought out because they are all written after the, 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 the advent of Ashoka. So you see, this is, this is, uh, this, this inscription, you know, is found in 2009 and you can, you can appreciate that, you know, still there is so much of the Ashokan remains needs to be discovered and found. This is found in Bihar in, 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 in 2009. And, and the word at the top is Dhamma. You know, this is how the word Dhamma is written in the, in the uh, Brahmi script. If Brahmism is normal. It's actually Ashoka Lipi. It's the Dhamma Lipi. So Ashoka had this deep, you know, desire to communicate the Dhamma. And he was one of the greatest communicators of, of, of the Dhamma and of, of the governance based on the Dhamma, you know, for the welfare and the happiness of all. He was perhaps might be the first emperor in the world who declared that he's the father of all citizens and he would try to look after them just like a father looks after their children. So you see the Dhamma Lipi of Ashoka, you know, Ashoka, it is said, invented the Brahmi Lipi. Or Ashokan Lipi. And because, because prior to that, we don't have many references to the 
Dhamma Lipi. Now some of the scholars are saying that you know there is uh, there is the mention of uh, Dhamma Lipi uh, or what is called the Brahmi Lipi in Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka. But you know it's still uh, the big debate is not yet settled. But but lot of scholar inclined like like Harry Falk and you know uh, Doctor Dayal they emphasize that the script uh, of of uh, you know ashoka was was invented by himself and he got people together it's a very amazing sort of a, of a invention to invent a script like brahmi because it has got such a tremendous impact on the history of the world it is the script that has given birth to all i would say invariably except chinese script all the scripts in the in the southeast asia and and east asia and it's a very interesting point that has been now made by the, the by the by the people who study the scripts that Ashokan script was, you know, the 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 the, the, the Tamil script or or all the Dravidian script have their uh, ancestor in the in the Brahmi script. So we can look at how important it was to to invent a script like that. Of course, at the time of Ashoka, there was a form of writing available, but the writing was mostly done on the bark leaves, on the on the on the cloths. Because you know, uh, to administer such a huge swath of land, they had to communicate with a lot of people, and you know, there was, of course, use of writing, which was used for the purpose of of of, of running the government and also for the purpose of running the businesses. So, and we know that the Buddha emphasized on you know discussion and dialogue, and therefore you know the uh, most of the times we see the Buddhist sutra as the questions to the Buddha, and the Buddha's answers to them. So, Ashoka, you know. Uh, invented dhammalipi let's let, let's let's assume that for the moment because now the more scholarship is tending towards that and the dhammalipi was to be read even if one person were present so these all scriptures all these inscriptions or all these pillars which ashoka erected were meant to be read and and you see you see what a word that that ashoka used even if one person were present and the language of the ashokan uh, inscriptions is is prakrit Gandhara and Gandhara, and you know, of course, there is a Dravidian Prakrit. So a lot of information has come from Fashian, who visited our country, the Indian subcontinent in Sri Lanka and during that period, Shuanzang, and, and Ashoka used four scripts. He used four scripts to communicate his message and, and all these languages: Ashokan Brahmi, Aramaic, Kharosti, and Greek. So you see, you see how you know the Ashoka as an emperor stands at the very center of the development of the culture because the culture begins when the things are put in writing, when people have something before them so that they can think about, they can, they can, they can cogitate upon, or they can reflect upon. So this is what uh, you know. These the, the inscriptions begin. Deva Nama Piya Piya Dasi Laja Laja is of course Raja Evam Aha. This is what he said. And there are 150 inscriptions and anthologies. You know, these Ashokan pillars or the edicts are marked with different anthologies, and and they are common in a lot of places. They are the same in a lot of places. So Ashokan inscriptions or anthologies are written on the minor rock edicts, major rock edicts, major pillar edicts, minor pillar edicts, and miscellaneous edicts. And this is from Nala Sopara, and it's in in the in the in the Bombay Museum. The erstwhile uh, Prince of Wales Museum. You can you can even visit today this Ashokan uh, inscription, which he carved in Nala Sopara in Bombay. And we are going to see how these places were important in terms of the the Buddhist uh, inclination towards trade and commerce. That all the major places, majority of them are on the coastal side of it. So that that's that's for the next sort of a lecture. But you know, suffice it to say that this is from Nala Sopara. Now, discovering Ashoka is a very interesting process that has taken place. It has its own history. And Charles Allen has brought a very interesting sort of a narrative history of how, the, how Ashoka was discovered. I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to uh, put some points before you that Chinese monks who, 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 who left back the uh, chronicles or their accounts and their travelogues have become an important source of, of, of unlocking the Ashokan mystery and and hence bringing out the true history of of India, because without in without uh, you know now though there is a partisan sort of a historians in India you know which try to guard the interest of one class as we have seen in the previous talks. Despite of that, the objectivity 
in the history of India is born by this great travelers to India. And not just two, there were many who came till the 14th century. And that we are going to see in the next lectures. But here is very important to mention these two great Buddhist monks from China who, rem who left the records of, 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 the, of the Buddhist India, we can say. And they, they meticulously mentioned the places, the directions, and what they found in different places. These chronicles or these travelogues became so handy for the future archaeologists of India that based on them, they discovered many places. Many, many places were discovered, reading the Suyuki and, and, and the books of uh, uh, Master Fashian. So this is just the artistic rendering of Fashian when he visited India. The first photograph and the second is that of a Fashian, of course, the artistic rendering. And, and the third photo is that of uh, Xuanzang. Now, deciphering the Dhammalipi is itself a very interesting process that has happened. And, you know, it has its roots in Sanchi. And this is James Princep who deciphered the Dhammalipi or Ashoklipi in 1837, working with materials and information collected by the archaeologists. So it was not that, you know, the, the just one person was involved in deciphering Dhammalipi. You know, there was, of course, the network of a lot of people, you know, who were, who were, who were taking, you know, handwriting the script, who were taking the, uh, you know, uh, various traces of the scripts that they found, inscription that they found, and sending it to the Royal Asiatic Society, which became sort of a hub of the discoveries of Ashoka and Buddhism afterwards. So this is very interesting that in 1837, for the first time after the long history, because when Xuanzang came to India, he of course saw Ashokan's inscriptions, but he there was nobody who could read it for him. That's in the 7th seven, seven century. There was nobody in India who could read the Ashokan script. And uh, the other archaeologists provided very important clues, clues to discover Ashoka and his legacy. Now, this is uh, the... Uh, script of, of Ashoka and we can see that the modern modern Devanagari and all these important scripts are evolved from it. And we can we can of course do it for all the scripts like we can do it for the Telugu script, we can do it for the Kannada script and we can trace it all the way up to the Ashokan script. So this is a very interesting sort of a piece of evidence here deciphering uh, Dana, the word Dana and Sir. So you know this is the inscription which helped to decipher the first words of, of, of the Ashokan script. Like, for example, this, uh, you know, wiggling uh, word is the, dana, and uh, danang, and this is the sir. So, you know, this word was is repeated even if you go to Sanchi today, and if you look at a lot of inscriptions there, they end up with these words and for, you know, preceded by sir. So, uh, if you have to say it like, you know, if we say uh, my Mangesh dana, you can say Mangeshasa Danan. So, you know, the first words which were deciphered were the word Dana and then Sir, because, you know, Buddhist scriptures, because there was a living language which was, you know, Prakrit and Pali, which was there to unlock the script. And the, the script was very fast deciphered when the first clues were, were you know, uh, uh, found. So, it's a very interesting way by which, you know, the, the, uh, the script was deciphered. Now, when once the script was deciphered, the Buddhist monuments and the archaeological site, you know, sites, they didn't remain silent. Like if we go to Sanchi, you know, today you can see the cacophony of voices there. You know, the merchants speaking, the 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 women speaking, the tribal people speaking, the artisans are speaking. They all scarred in in the Sanchi stupa. And if you go to same is the case if you go to Kaneri caves or if you go to Nashik caves, you know, you can see this cacophony of voices return there so once once the the, the 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 script was you know deciphered a lot of information came you know the flood of information came and and you know i'm i you know how different sites were discovered is another story but i'm going to focus on lumbini because you know this is what is written in lumbini there was ashoka went there and he erected the pillar up there and you know this is the ashokan pillar and on the top there was horse and 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 ashoka has written there that here the Buddha was born. And that's how the place of the Buddha, uh, the birth of the Buddha, the place related to the birth of the Buddha was discovered. So, of course, you know, there were other Buddhist sources which helped to, uh, you know, discover Ashoka, like Harshavardhana knew of Ashoka and declared himself the king of Magadha because he was very friend. He was a friend of Shivanzang. Shivanzang knew Ashoka and Ashoka's memory was not gone. 
And there is a 13th century Burmese inscription, which I have shown you here, which mentions Ashoka at Mahabodhi and Ripumalla in 14th century inscribed Om Mani Padme Hum on Lumbini pillar that I just show, I have just shown you. Then there were, of course, the Sri Lankan sources, Deepavansa and Mahavansa, they were the chronicles which brought out the story of, of Ashoka. And then Indian tradition, the textual traditions, for example, the Puranas mentions Ashoka, the Gita is a parody on Ashoka's non-violence, Ramayana's Maharam is pitted against Ashoka's Dhamma, you know, now this lot of research have come up. Kalana mentions Ashoka in Raja Tarangini, 12th century, and Abu Fazl mentioned Ashoka with a reference from Raja Tarangini in his Aine Akbari, which was supposed to be the constitution of Akbar, as who, as one who abolished Brahmanical religion. This is in the 16th century. So it is not that, you know, Ashoka's memory was gone or dead. So why was Ashoka and Buddhism forgotten in India? That's the question of that we are going to tackle in the, in the fifth lecture, but I'm just going to touch briefly on that because it has got the uh you know got to do with uh, what we are talking about ashoka today so this is from kanagana halli which is now which was discovered in 1986 which is which is near muski which was the town of gold suvarnagiri and and big stupa was erased there and this is the ashokan uh inscription here and you you notice remember this small hole there because you know that has some story which i'm going to come to and how the geography buddhist geography was renamed rechanged how the Buddhist Buddhist history was distorted in the upcoming lectures, but this is just to show that how the Ashokan legacy stands today in terms of complete distortion of it. The Islamic iconoclastic fundamentalism was also responsible for it. You know, this is the pillar that you can see near the mosque, and 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 this is this is uh, Firoz Shah Tughlaq, who had you know this. There is a Firoz Shah Kotla ground in Delhi. There in the in the beginning there was this pillar. And, and this is how the big pillar was brought from one place to where, you know, Tughlaq was, you know, in, in Delhi uh, through Yamuna. And you can, you can see it there. This pillar has a very interesting history. It's in Allahabad and it's an Ashokan pillar. And it's, it's also now after that inscribed by the Gupta, the Guptas who were not sympathetic to Buddhism. They were so, you know, they, they, they strove for the Varna state, the Varna based society. And, you know, they inscribed their inscriptions here. And afterwards, even Jahangir has inscribed on this pillar of, of Ashoka. You see, you know, this is very symbolic as we were talking in the previous, uh, uh, you know, talks, how, you know, symbolic things represent, you know, if you want to destroy something, you destroy the symbols. The Buddhism was destroyed by destroying the symbols. So I, I just brought these slides to tell you, you know, the Magadha was not in isolation. It was an international state which had his connections with, with 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 gandhara where there were a lot of hellenic greeks who were living in gandhara and 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 you know the rice and sugar of course was was taken from india to the west and uh, the dravidian word for rice is arise and and the greek word is oriza oriza sativa is what uh, what you call this is the stupa dhammarajika stupa even standing today in pakistan and this is the ashokan inscription in the greek language and Ashoka and Persia had, had connections because that time Persia, Persia was ruled or the present Iran was ruled by Achaemenides of Iran had developed big political systems and their Kharosht script was used by Ashoka to write in his region around their kingdom. So these are the four scripts that Ashoka used to you know, propagate his message. Now some scholars say that Ashoka derived his, uh, his script, invented his scripts based on the, on, the, on, the, on the scripts used by the Achaemenides. Now, Ashoka's Dharma is very crucial to understand. And, and this was found in the bottom, the place called Bharat in Rajasthan, where Ashoka mentions Dhamma Pariyal, Paliyal. In the today's word, it will Dhamma Pariyal. And this word has a very significant meaning in Buddhism, that there are many doors that lead to the enlightenment, Dhamma Pariyal. And Ashoka used this word Dhamma Pariyal, and he mentioned the seven texts. And, and, and all these texts are very important. Uh, when it comes to understanding Ashoka Dharma, of course, Ashoka's inscriptions are very interesting because, you know, Ashoka never mentions about Varna, Ashoka never mentions about Vedas, he never mentions about Karma, he never mentions about rebirth. He talks about the Dhamma, which, you know, which is like the kingdom of righteousness here on the earth. He say, encourages people that, you know, there is no difference from the high and low. All should combine together to this project of enlightenment, as it were. 
So, you know, these are very important suttas that we see and people are not sure some of the scholars, but we can definitely find some of the suttas in the Pali and other 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 texts like this lagula lagula vada sutra is of course raula vada sutra and and you know this the sutta talks about pacha vekhan a process of reflective reflective morality and you know it's very interestingly baba sahib ambedkar mentions it and ashoka mentions it and the topmost photo is the is, is the is the sculpture of of ashoka built uh, during the satwan period and it, there is inscribed a word called raya ashoka and there were other kings also there which were sculpted there. So I'm going to just uh, uh, spend a minute or two on this rock edict four, because I think this is very important, because Ashoka says that no living being must be killed and sacrificed. So thus he denied all the yagyas and yagas. And in the past, there is a word that uh, he used, Poran Pakiti, means past traditions, where in the past, for many hundreds of years, there had been had ever been promoted the killing of animals. Now this is not to be done. So whatever traditions they were, they, if they were promoting the killings of animals, he stopped it altogether. He was against rituals. He made, makes it clear in his inscriptions that he's against rituals. And he said, all sects should be both should both be full of learning and pure in doctrine. Very important word. Because Ashoka's intolerance was not just that he was tolerating all the faiths. He was encouraging them to be too pure. And, you know, they should learn the truth. And intellectual conversation conversion was there and there was non-confrontation. That's a very great quality of Ashoka. Building a new model of development with the Shramana at the center. So Ashoka, and when we go to the uh, next uh, lectures, we're going to look at the models of development. And the Ashoka model of, de model of development of, of an open society, of an inclusive society, of, of, of universal you know, morality, of reflective morality was so appealing that soon after Ashoka, the Indian subcontinent became so economically powerful that evidences of that are even found today. And, uh, you know, he, he gave the special message to the uh, business or mercantile class. He supported the mercantile class. He built the roads. He built, he encouraged the building of the stupas and warehouses and whatnot. And he had very important message for the merchants because they were the prominent communities that has supported Buddhism and their guilt, their corporations were so important for the spread of Buddhism when we are going to look at them in the next coming talk. So his message to the businessman was very clear, discharge the debt which I owe to living beings and making them happy. He created infrastructure for the traders and merchants and law and order offered for facilitation of trade and commerce. Now the Uttarpath, which is now the Grand Track Road of today, even we can discover Uttarpath, which was going from all the way from Bengal to, to Gandhara, you know, is dotted with the Dhamma pillars. And many of these pillars are found on the left bank of Gandhak River. Stupa monuments all over the main cities and centers of trade. Dhamma Yatra was personally made by Ashoka. Every five years, he made the Dhamma Yatra. They became such an important feature of Buddhist kings that they used to, they used to celebrate it as a Panchavarshika. A very important word that, you know, the Chinese emperors did it. The, uh, you know, Harshavardhan did it. And many Buddhist kings did it. Every five years, they had this big gathering which was called the Moksha gathering, where they talked about the Dharma. Ensuring the integrity of the Sangha as people try to enter the Sangha because it, it has become a powerful institution. And there are, of course, Ashoka took steps to resist the inf infiltration into the Buddhist Sangha. The sutras mentioned, uh, you know, so, so he was very keen on the learning of Buddhism. So just to, you know, last slides, I'm going to come back to Ashoka in China and beyond. Emperor Wu of Liang dynasty of 600 uh, century emulated Ashoka by erecting stupas. Impress U Jetian in the seventh century, she declared herself Chakravarti. Very important because you know the Buddhist kings were always you know uh, modeling them on the line of Chakravarti, not somebody who is holding the the the, the rod or the danda. You know danda niti. They never believe in danda. They believe in the dhamma niti, you know, the niti based on the dhamma. And Ashoka Stupa rebuilt in China in 2015 at Nangchen. This is the Drukpa tradition of Tibetan, which which has rebuilt the Ashokan stupa. There were, of course, 19 stupas in China built by Ashoka, according to the legion. Ashoka in Sri Lanka, of course, this is the photograph of, of Mintale, where, where Mahindra, this is Mahindra stupa. And these small stupas are found in the place called Kanta Rudai, which is in, which is near Japna, in, in near Nagadipa. There is still a deeper in between India and China called the Nagadipa. And there are very ancient stupas that are found there. And Ashoka, of course, encouraged Devnam Piyatissa, 
to take refuge in Tri Ratna in his during his second uh, coronation, and he took up the Tri Ratna, and he was he 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 played his important role to uh, establish Buddhism in Sri Lanka. And this word Devanam Priya, because it was mentioned in Dipa once, and also it is the name of Ashoka. It created confusion about the identity of who the great emperor was, but that's not the story uh, for the lecture today. Ashoka Stupa in Pathan, Nepal. Nepal, you know, though it is now a uh, separate nation state, the importance of Nepal cannot be underestimated when we look at the uh, history of Buddhism, which we are going to look in the next lectures. But this is the Ashoka Stupa in Pathan, and, and, and Nepal has a continuous history of Buddhism from a long period of time. And it, it becomes a kind of a template to understand what might have happened to Buddhism in India. Now there is, of course, you know, there is not proper excavation because excavation is, is a process by which a lot of things are discovered and a lot of things are lost. And still a lot of excavation needs to be done, particularly Patliputra or Patna, you know, where allegedly now uh, some of the remains of Kukutaram, a very famous monastery built by Ashoka. One of the biggest monasteries built by Ashoka, which was vandalized by Pushyamitra Shunga after his coup. Coup and uh, you know the you know the remains of that are found. This is of course the city plan of Mauryan Takshila on the Bir Mound. But you know we need to discover more of these cities because you know they are there wherever there is a Mahachetya deep down that near to that there are the Ashokan cities which are deeply buried. And you know how the geography was shifted from the Ashokan geography to the present geography is a very interesting process that we are going to look at. This is a well which was according to legend it is. Before Ashoka became a Buddhist, he used to put people here. So uh, it is called the hell of Ashoka. It's, it, it's, it's in Patna. We, you know, we don't know the veracity of that, but these are some of the things that are propping up. Now, Ashoka's legacy continued today when Dr. Baba Sambedkar embraced Buddhism on, 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 on Ashoka Vijaya Dashmi. And this is the photograph of Ashoka Dashmi. The, another, the rest of the photographs are very interesting. So in the in the month of February, on uh, in the month of February 5th, date on uh, fifth day uh, in 2012, as I told you, these are all for, you know, a place called Sannati. And Sannati is apparently the place where Ashoka died. And we don't have much information about that because this site was discovered in 1986. And this uh, uh, inscription I asked you to uh, bear in mind in the previous slides, very interesting because, you know, all in this in this whole square hole, the image of a very wrathful form of a Durga was kept called the Chandralamba, Chandralamba. And one Ambedkarite uh, Buddhist monk, Bodhidhamma barged into that and he removed it. And then it, it became a big matter. He was arrested and put in jail with another four laymen. And uh, there were a lot of controversy and he was, he was trying to bring out the attention to how the Hinduization of the Buddhist sites are done. You know, it's in the plain sight. You can see the Ashokan inscription there. You can see uh, you know, uh, another inscription which was found in uh, Sannati, you can see the Buddhas are lying just like that. And I have been to Sannati and I found that, you know, that time, maybe 10 years back, the place was in a horrible shape. And 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 here is an Ambedkarite Buddhist monk who was trying to stop the process of, of the Brahmanization or the Hinduization of, of very authenticate Buddhist sites, which we can see very clearly even when we visit there. So I think Ashoka's legacy is very important even today because the uh, fundamentalist Hindu forces try to malign the uh, legacy of Ashoka. Veer Savarkar, you know, attributes him to the uh, you know fall of India. But if you look at what happened to India, which is the story I'm going to tell in the incoming in the in the forthcoming lectures, a very interesting way that how open, how prosperous, how peaceful India was built by Ashoka and how his legacy continued for a long time and how it had had the far reaching impact on both the East and the West of India, because India was as if the center of the globe that time. So I will stop here uh, my presentation on Ashoka and discovery of Ashoka. And maybe we can take some, some, some questions because this, this, there is a lot of material which is available now and I have to, you know, uh, squeeze them in the 40 minutes lecture, but you, you, you begin to get an idea of, 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 of how profound is the legacy of, of Ashoka and how he was forgotten, you know, by the mainstream so-called, you know, traditions and, you know, how his rediscovery has is uh, led to, you know, knowing the history of India as it is.
and 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 archaeological sources are more authenticated than the textual sources because the textual sources though they can go they can be gone back again and again to reread but they can be also tempered but this written whatever is written on the stone can never be changed of course there were efforts to change it vandalize it as we have seen you know in the presentation and as we are going to see in the future lectures but i think this gives us an idea as to the importance of ashoka and you know his discovery to india so i'll stop here and take up any questions that you know that might be there yeah <laughs> Your voice is breaking, uh, Dinesh. Yes, go on. It's okay now. Yes, it's okay now. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying this wonderful lecture in uh, many aspects. Uh, I think that should be uh, We cannot hear you, Dinesh. I'm sorry. Okay, I think uh, we can we can take up this question of uh, Bodhi sir. He says how many rock edicts, both major and minor. They are saying that there are hundred and eighty, uh, you know, sites which can be you know uh, where the Ashoka's inscriptions are are. Yes, Dinesh, you are back. Yeah. So no, I'm saying yeah, yeah. We can we can take this two question. One is from Bodhi sir, another from Bisal. So he's asking there is a uh, one uh, talk. I mean, Amritsan used this Nipi. and yeah and drawing from the history so is he taken from the asoka so that's two questions so niti and nay are 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 very very late addition to the indian political thought the the more concise and 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 detailed political thoughts we can only find in 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 ashoka's writings and ashoka's inscriptions because you know the even the date of kautilya which people say that you know he arthashastra was written before ashoka and you know now that is also questioned because the language doesn't match with that with the time and there is also mention of of buddhism in the in the in a, in a negative way in arth arth shastra of kautilya so you know these are all debatable question but there is no doubt that ashoka had was the first to write in a very clear way his political thought and we can we can we can we can we can we can, we can almost construct the political thoughts and political theory of ashoka based on buddhism and the buddha had definite political vision ashoka had a definite political vision of a society which was open inclusive prosperous you know believing in trade and commerce you know integration of the so called highs and lows bringing harmony in harmony in the community stopping violence and even environmentalism because ashoka stopped what is called the slash and burn uh the you know activities he said that no forest should be burnt and he stopped you know the killing of animals he himself uh, you know uh, nearly became a vegetarian so we we know for sure that ashoka had and then as i was telling you that the gita is parody on 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 ashoka because here is krishna telling arjuna fight kill kill it is your dharma it's your religion to kill but if you look at ashoka you know ashoka had never resorted to violence after the kalinga war and and people say that you know some of the scholars are of the opinion that he won south by the context of conquest of war it is not that he did, he he didn't stop using the force he of course threatened some of the uh, violent groups with force he said that if you don't obey the dhamma i might use the force because you know they were obstructing the trade and commerce so there is a rich sort of uh, uh material which is available to be developed 
into the political theories. And, and as I told you, that the scholarship has been partisan so far because the uh, people who have been involved in the Ashokan studies, there are, of course, great scholars now who are emerging, like Giovanni Berardi. Charles Allen was, of course, a very great scholar. He died. Uh, Harry Falk, to name a few foreigners. Patrick Oliwell. There are a lot of people who are coming, even in, in the, from the Indian uh, background. Um, there is Professor Lairi and other people. But the kind of scholarship that has to be focused on Ashoka is, is still not there. The archaeology is a completely neglected part in our country. The medieval archaeology is not there, isn't it? And uh, but there is a lot of rich material that we can find and triangulate used, uh, you know, using the various texts or textual material that are there, you know, backing it up with with whatever archaeological findings available there. So the language of the period of Ashoka was Prakrit, which is a Pali language, and 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 now also the the uh, the the sources of Pali are being discussed. That you know there is a lot of you know there is a strata in Pali which 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 goes back to also the Dravidian languages. So you know we 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 don't when we think about the ancient India we don't think about India cut dry into different kingdoms. The people were moving from all different places, different places, the, the traders, the mercantile classes, the Buddhist monks were roaming all over the places. So, you know, the, the, the language, it is said, it's also said that the Buddha developed Pali language out of so many languages to communicate his Dhamma. Because that was a people, Buddha was, you know, walking in a lot of places. And we know that the language changes. Even today we have Avadi, Magadi, Braj Bhasha in that part of the world, Magadha. So you can imagine at the time of the Buddha, there might not be one language. So Buddha, like the Hindi, which is created today using so many languages, which, which ascribe to Hindi by, 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 you know, to the great Eastern Buddhist scholars like Rahul Sankrit and Badanan Koshal and so on and so forth. Likewise, we can say that the Buddha has, has, has created that, that language, that ecumenial language, which will speak deriving from all this uh, existing uh, dialects, to, you know, to communicate his Dhamma. That is a real possibility. And some of the scholars are saying, that the Buddha created the Pali language to, you know, teach his Dhamma. Are there any Ashokan archaeological remains in Iran? Iran that time was governed by Archimedes, as I told you, and they were very powerful kingdoms, but Ashoka definitely had a contact with that, with, with those powers, and Ashoka, Ashoka told him the quest of truth, and he, he talked Ahinsa to them. So uh, I think we should stop now. It's already uh, uh, seven, and we can take this question maybe later. Is that okay? So, yeah. Okay. No, okay. Yeah, yeah. So so thank you, uh, Vernal Mangesh Devale, once again on behalf of uh, Navyana Buddhist Charitable Trust and the school and all the participants for their time and they came.